If you haven't been into the Speakers Forum before at the Green Gathering, welcome. This is a really good space. We get to hear from loads of different people. It's a real privilege, actually, to loads of different people who are involved in areas of policy or who are on the front line doing activism. And now we're going to have Tony Gosling talking to us about propaganda. Tony is a journalist and broadcaster. He's well known to this tent. He uh, is a, a faithful contributor uh, in this uh, setting. So um, I'm going to hand over to him. Great. Point, I think, yeah. And we will have questions at the end, I'm pretty sure. So do start thinking about your questions. Hello. OK, well, thanks for staying after all those tempta temptations to leave and talk to all the leaders of the Green Party. Um, uh, my name's Tony Gosling. I've, I've come along to these uh, Green Gatherings every year, partly because I'm based in Bristol and we're, it's very easy for me to nip out on a Saturday uh, after we do our weekly current affairs radio programme uh, in Bristol every Friday evening. Uh, and, and also because the broadcasting we do in Bristol, I think, is connected in with what this festival's about, in a way, because, uh, for example, last week... Um, we did a recorded a programme which is going to be broadcast next Tuesday uh, with uh, a guy called Timothy Herford. You've probably never heard of Tim, but he's a, a singer-songwriter, ex-stand-up um, comic, gardener, and uh, they have a band in Bristol called The Transpersonals. And we had what I love to do, which is a fascinating conversation about the history of festivals in Britain and the our ability as... A people in a democratic country to actually organize our own affairs and what we'll be hearing after my talks finished is about Pitchford which is where you've got the secret state effectively the police security services interfering with our right to self-organize so if we want to get together a movement to change things it would be nice to be able to do that like Phoenix we were hearing from earlier on you know uh, this is the uh, attempt to uh, to open up more space for people public spaces affordable homes, uh, to transform our environment. Because what we've got, and I really want to follow on from that housing talk we've just had, because I actually did have my hand up, uh, and because I'm a, the next speaker, I've got a slight advantage and I can actually say what I was going to say. Uh, and that is, the housing crisis is very simple, really, it seems to me, is you've got uh, a, a totally failing economic system. Well, it's not failing, it's under attack. It's being destroyed. Since 2008... Uh, we had the biggest heist in history. The Western uh, financial elite decided that they were going to uh, do false accounting for a few years and then they were going to threaten Gordon Brown, which is what they did, and various other leaders around the Western world. They said, basically, we're, they were like suicide bombers in the room with the politicians. And they said, well, either you bail us out or the entire financial system is going west tonight tomorrow uh, and the cash points will all stop and no one will be able to take any money out and everyone will be pointing the finger at you so bail us out and although Gordon Brown said afterwards with a little Freudian slip I saved the world actually the, entirely the opposite was true he has screwed things up permanently uh, we've now got uh, a financial system which is heading down the tubes very fast. If you look at our national debt, I did a little, there's an article from a couple of years ago in the Telegraph about this. What is our real national debt? Uh, it's actually far, far more than we're being told. At the moment, it's going up officially at 200 billion a year. So uh, the national debt going up at 200 billion a year, and it's going up faster and faster all the time. Uh, so there's obviously nothing being done about trying to stop the deficit. Uh, the, the real figure, if I can find it in here, uh, is, is horrific. It's far, far worse. It's something like three times... Uh, this is how inefficient I am, I'm afraid, having to flip through here to try and find the figures. Here we go. Uh, the article was the 20th of August 2010, uh, and it's the, the headline was Government Urged to Reveal the True National Debt of $4.8 trillion. Uh, the Institute of Economic Affairs, the IEA, calculated the national debt is $4.8 trillion once state and public sector person pension liabilities are also included, or £78,000 for every person in the UK. So every time you hear the figure 1.5 trillion, I think you just have to... I mean, if you, if you extend it to today, that article, uh, in, what, in 2010 when the article was written, the official debt was 1.2 trillion. 
uh, unofficially it was 4.8 trillion. Now, in 2016, the official debt is 1.7 trillion, unofficially 6.8 trillion. So it's going up and up and up at a skyrocketing rate, and the bankers just love it because it's more and more excuse for QE, quantitative easing printing money, which goes to them and not to us. And uh, they're getting richer and richer and richer all the time. Now, as a result of all this, you've got bubbles, housing bubble and a stock market bubble, right? <laughs> so uh, the reason we've got a housing crisis is largely because the ha the, the, those two bubbles are traditional places for people to invest. Housing is actually much safer than the stock market. The stock market can just go down, as we learned in 1929, just like that, and it nearly did in 2008. So investors are now increasingly looking to put their money into housing as safer than the stock market. And certainly much better than in, uh, leaving it in a bank because interest rates are heading towards negative interest rates. So the idea is people, in, people are investing, they're being sort of shifted around in great uh, tens of millions, if there are tens of millions of people with large amounts of money, I suppose there are, uh, from one way of investing, one way place to put their money, and it's ending up towards housing as the safest bet in a fragile world where, uh, say, an attack in, in the Middle East could end up uh, stopping the oil supply to the West, and then everything would just crash down. So people are aware of this, that it is very fragile. The system is very fragile. Uh, and as a result, more and more uh, housing is by... We just had a, p a piece of news this week, I think it was The Guardian reported it, that th we have the lowest rate of home ownership in 30 years. So people aren't, don't own their own homes. Uh, what's happening is the investors are coming in, buy to let landlords. We all know there's a crisis. I would say the solution, as we were talking about right at the end of the previous talk, is what we're doing in Bristol. It's pretty simple. It's called BAM, Bristol Housing Action Movement. And we get together uh, every Monday evening and we put people who need housing together with existing groups, sometimes People come along for a few weeks, they meet people that they get on with, and then they'll start a new squat of some sort. Because a lot of this uh, land and housing and property that people are investing in is empty. And so you've got, really, I mean, you're an entrepreneur, aren't you? You need somewhere to live. There's all this empty housing. Move in. This is uh, uh, largely... Uh, I mean, quite often you'll get a few weeks in there. Sometimes you get a heavy landlord of some sort. But what you're doing is you're saying, well, here's a, here's a need. Here's a, a, a surplus. Let's just make, take advantage of it. And the other thing is, I mean, I was squatting for two years in one place, which was beautiful, and uh, just had just been done up by the Housing Association and, and did pay a penny rent all the time. The first thing we did was uh, just turned on the, uh, started paying for the electricity, the water and all that stuff. Uh, and that's all we paid for two years in a beautiful place. So there is an opportunity for entrepreneurs out there to get together with others at places like our Bristol Housing Action, get tooled up with things like the Squatters Handbook from this, uh, the, the Advisory Service for Squatters. And the fact of the matter is, and I've done both private renting and I'm in a housing association place now, um, and squatting. And the squatting was actually, not all the time, but quite often it was... Uh, more uh, more safe and more permanent than the private renting. Absolutely crazy situation where we're living in now. Uh, and so there, I think, is, you know, we just simply have to go around the system. And, of course, it's much nicer not having to pay anything for your rent when you're squatting. So, anyway, that's just really what I wanted to say, kind of to tail off the previous talk. But, in a way, that analysis, we've just, I've just given you there about the national debt and what's going on with the economy and the bankers being like suicide bombers in the room with the politicians in 2008 uh, is the sort of stuff we're not really getting analysis of in our fi mainstream journalism, particularly not in financial journalism. Uh, there is one guy who's a freelance writer called Ian Fraser who you can find online. Uh, he writes for the Scottish Sunday Herald and I think the, the, the Herald in Glasgow uh, and he's one of the only journalist I've ever come across who writes honestly about the financial system and he came on our radio show in Bristol uh, a few years ago and uh, it said well look all these financial journalists they're just in the pocket of the city so they just write whatever the city wants in fact you'll find this in increasingly in London in, in because people don't necessarily twig this it doesn't happen in all countries but here in Britain all of our national news and all of our international news comes from London everything 
We don't have regional... Uh, the Guardian newspaper started in Manchester, right, as a regional, national and international outlet, but it then moved to London. <laughs> so I think well, this is one of the th models that I'd like to see expanding around the country, is we need to have better regional journalism talking about national and international affairs. So that's what we do in Bristol on the radio every week for two hours. Uh, current affairs, we have, a, uh, we have a politician in for the first hour, have a chat with them through the local national stories, and then we do uh, more out there stuff in the second hour, more investigative journalism. For example, last night, I was very pleased during the week to get a call from the father of, of someone called Tom Hayes. Tom uh, was imprisoned uh, this time last year, exactly a year ago, for, for 14 years, uh, for conspiracy to commit fraud with the LIBOR fraud. Well, he was a trader. He was just simply following orders. Effectively, he was doing what he was told as part of his job. And because he didn't fit in with the other traders, he wasn't a coke snorting, alcohol imbibing, wild kind of crazy guy who would do absolutely anything to make money. He was just a kind of ordinary chap. He was singled out. He was scapegoated for the LIBOR fraud. And so it's quite nice that, that, that Nick Hayes, his father actually contacted me and said, look, I want to come on the radio and talk about what's happened to Tom because I've been trying through the London media for a year to get this story out. We did a similar thing with the London Olympics four years ago. Of course, the Olympics are going on just the opening ceremony started last night. It was quite impressive at midnight, watching it on the telly. Um, but what's the Olympics about? The Olympics seems to me to be about a, an opportunity for world leaders uh, uh, Putin's not there apparently to get together to have quiet chats about the way they want to sort the world out for themselves to work for them not for us uh, behind the scenes whilst they watch a whole bunch of performing acrobats um, show just how strong and tough and fast they are so this is about uh, a kind of it's not an intellectual exercise, it's a physical exercise. So physical prowess is all that's important, not intellectual prowess or not uh, the ability to deconstruct what's going on around you. That doesn't matter. Uh, and as if by magic, uh, Nick Hayes, who was on the, uh, the radio with me last night, he used to be the editor of a programme, some of you might remember, called World in Action. Uh, he's based in Manchester. His son just so happened to be the trader who was scapegoated for LIBOR. Uh, and he explained to us the way that uh, this was a quite fragile ecosystem that they were running in the 1970s and 1980s. He was the editor in 1990s. He worked, worked for um, Current Affairs at the BBC, then went over to Channel 4 Dispatches. So there really isn't any proper investigative journalism going on in London anymore, maybe a little bit in the newspapers. So we're there in Bristol in a way to kind of capture the people who've tried to get through to the media in London, hit a brick wall, and then they come and have a chat to us, uh, as uh, this chap Ben Fellows did back four years ago, uh, when he was training to be a security guard for the London Olympics. He then found that uh, he then found that there wasn't any proper real security going to be happening at the London Olympics. In other words, things like their, the the torches that they used to scan people were going to be switched off. Uh, that there was, uh, they were only going to actually really check one in five people as they came through the turnstiles. This kind of stuff they were, he was being told about. He came on the radio, talked about it, and we then had a, a sort of break. I sent this information. I said, I can't verify what he's saying, but I sent it to the MPs, I sent it to the police, etc., cetera, and, um, and to the army. And then I heard back, two weeks afterwards, I was driving back from Western Supermare to Bristol, and on the radio... We pulled over. I couldn't believe it. Three and a half thousand troops being drafted in to take over from G4S because they're not up to the job. Yeah. And then the week after, another 1,500. So they had 5,000 soldiers take over from G4S. And I'm not saying that our story was why that happened, but it was part of why it happened, that we were able to broadcast that in Bristol, distribute it around the internet. It went viral online. And when you shove it in the front of the faces of the people who have got to make these decisions, if anything goes wrong, they're, really, they're aware, and I made sure all those people confirmed that they'd received that interview and the copy of it. So this is what I'm saying is, is effectively you're dealing with uh, a very propagandised system in London. Uh, I mean, s akin to the Soviets. I just, I'd just like to see a show of hands. How many people here regularly watch and listen to the news? Stick your hand up if you do, yeah? 
So that's about maybe uh, 40%, something like that. Now, there's a reason for that. It's because most of what we're being told is nonsense. In one way or another, I mean, there's half-truths being told, and it's really dispiriting. I don't know if you find it like that. If you, when, when I'm just driving down here today, you hear something, you think, that's rubbish. They're just talking nonsense. Let's, let's just take one example, uh, and I'll ask maybe in a minute, have a think to yourselves, if you can think of other examples, of something that comes onto the, t the TV or the, or the radio, and you think that's just nonsense. I mean, in a way, it's a bit like we were so told as children... Uh, the Soviet Union was supposed to be like, wasn't it? So people get told r lies, but then they kind of read between the lines and they know what's really going on anyway. So the lines are almost pointless. And that kind of comes back to the title of my talk originally, which was uh, a quote from George Orwell. And I don't, may, people may know George Orwell worked for the BBC in Bush House for the World Service in the Second World War. And about halfway through this, the World War II, I think it was about 1943, something like that. He wrote his resignation letter because he'd been working for the Indian service, broadcasting to India. And uh, he wrote them a very polite letter saying, I'm actually doing you a favour by resigning because this propaganda isn't working. And I think that's where we are now here in Britain is that there are attempts to convince people of things and it's not necessarily actually getting any traction. Uh, it's... It's just under a year since uh, Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader of the Labour Party, and I think it's pretty fair to say we've seen almost wall-to-wall -wall propaganda from the London media against Corbyn. Uh, we, we have uh, Laura Koonsberg at the BBC, the political editor, very making lots of kind of biased statements against Corbyn, looking for sort of holes to pick in, in, in him. I actually think Corbyn is... We're told again and again, aren't we, that he's uh, unelectable, <laughs> right? Now, this is totally the opposite of the truth. This is what you might call a kind of psych psyop, psychological warfare. We're being, I mean, the thing is, the ruling elite are scared to death of Corbyn being electable and being elected. So what they do is they put out the lie, he's unelectable, he's unelectable. For example, our local MP in Bristol East, Kerry McCarthy, she's just had her, she's one of the coup people who's decided Jeremy Corbyn's no good. Uh, Kerry has just had her local party vote to endorse Corbyn. So the people that fought to get her elected went out on the doorsteps and banged on doors who fought to get Kerry in as an MP and she's now taken against this leader. They've endorsed him as a leader. So what's going on with her? What is she doing? She's completely ignoring the people who got her elected in the first place. Something peculiar is, is happening in the Labour Party. Uh, so uh, she actually came on our... Actually, she wouldn't... No, she won't come on our radio show. Yeah, we're getting the omerta, like the mafia, from all of these coup MPs. They will not come on to speak on the radio uh, with us. So what I have to do is pinch their speeches on the BBC and various other places that they do speeches. I find them online and just rebroadcast them. Then we can discuss what, what she's saying here. One of the things she said is Corbyn is a cult-like figure. Right, hang on a minute. A cult-like figure. Right, that, what are you saying there? That you're, he's like a guru in some cult? This is actually really despicable for an MP that's supposed to be part of the same party to call her party leader that's been elected by the membership a cult-like figure. Very strange thing to say. And even more strange propaganda put out by Kerry was his heart's not in it. This is psychological warfare, right? Actually, Kerry, it's your heart that's not in it, yeah? And you're afraid that his heart is in it and that people can see that, so you're just lying to the public on the BBC to talk about this stuff. Anyway, if you saw uh, uh, Owen Smith launching his, uh, his um, uh, leadership bid against Jeremy Corbyn, Kerry McCarthy, uh, our local MP, was stood behind him and she looked very, very sort of sad and morose, which I thought, well, you know, sure, this is the guy you, you think is going to be elected. Well, anyway, so the Labour Party is not the only political party at the moment which seems to have some kind of psychological warfare going on within it to disrupt it. Uh, the, I phoned up yesterday, no, uh, Thursday lunchtime BBC Cardiff to say, oh, are you broadcasting the first of these uh, debates that's going on in Cardiff tonight with your BBC person chairing it? Uh, and they said, oh, no, we're not. 
So the, it, it's happening with the BBC chair in Cardiff, and it's the first of the leadership debates between Owen Smith and Jeremy Corbyn. But the BBC are not broadcasting it on radio or on television. Actually, I think it was News 24 or something broadcast it. But, but I find that extraordinary. If the BBC we pay for is sitting there in Cardiff with all these transmitters and, you know, we've got the future of the country at stake here, don't you think it would be nice to... Uh, broadcast that so people and actually it was a damn good debate and if anyone gets back home and you want to get online it is online and we broadcast some excerpts from it last night but it, you've got the audience reaction is extremely powerful to certain things that various of them are saying and you get a real good sense of hey something's at stake here folks it's our future which you don't get in some of the way that these things are, are presented in a pre-recorded way and sanitized by people like channel 4 news or whoever so there's, a tr I think, a tremendous amount of propaganda going down out there. I see the uh, media, uh, call me a bit of a hippie if you want, but I see the media as the nervous system of humanity, particularly broadcast media and radio, uh, which is why I want to be in there, because this is where the, many of the problems are that have stopped us sorting ourselves out as a species. So stopped us housing ourselves, stopped having uh, you know, the proper... A system of organising our power and our energy and this obsession with oil. Just one thing I'd just like to take as an example of that is some of the research that, that I was doing when I left the BBC, which I was working for in the early 1990s in London uh, and Wiltshire and Southampton, uh, was I was doing some research on the, the closed closure of the railways in the 1960s. Now, if you go all over this country, you'll find these heritage railways everywhere with these little chuffer trains going backwards and forwards. And in a way, it was a miracle that it happened when it did, because we wouldn't have those heritage railways if it had happened at another, another stage where steam was just being, you know, kind of phased out in the 60s at the same time as beaching closed the railways down. But the thing is, why did that happen at that particular time? And I think many of us are suspicious when we sit in a traffic jam on a motorway or when I have to drive down here, I'd much rather hop on the train in Bristol and come down to Chepstow and walk up or whatever or get a taxi and a bus. Why do I have to drive everywhere? It really annoys me. Well, the reason is pretty simple. If you look into it, you'll see the, the way that this entire nightmare of all the people dying on our roads. Uh, we had, for example, uh, in London, when I was a youngster in the 1980s, something called Fair's Fair, where Ken Livingstone, who was the mayor at the time, <laughs> uh, he, what he did, and I was going to school, and I found suddenly, one day I was going to school, and my bus ticket was cheaper than it was the day before. It was, I think it was 5p, and it went down to 3.5p. I thought, this is weird. But anyway, it's, it's, it was a real challenge to our preconceptions about the way we get around. And I, I think Livingston, what he did also was he and Dave Wetzel uh, introduced something called the travel card, which we now assume to use in London, where you can use lots of different you know, forms of transport on one card. Now, they had... They fought like crazy, the, the Labour group on the GLC at the time, to get that stuff in. But the main point I'm trying to make here is not about the price. It's about the, the, the decrease in the accidents in, across London was amazing. Over, in the first year, there were 800 less serious accidents on the roads in London. And this was just the first year. And it was only really allowed to run for about a year or two years before uh, it was stopped at the, by the... Uh, House of Lords. It was actually my local council, Bromley Council, that took them to court and stopped it. But you see, what, what you had there was a, a real challenge to the orthodoxy of ways of thinking about transport. And the reason we've got this orthodoxy about using cars all the time and polluting our environment and driving into people is it, it actually starts in the late 1950s. Because in the late 50s, there was oil exploration going on. Now, these oil companies, right, I'm, no, no, I'm, no, I'm sure there's nobody in this room that's a fan of oil companies, but they, what they were doing was a bit like the kind of Knights Templar in medieval times, right? So they explore, they find things, they don't tell anyone, and they sit down, right, what are we going to do with this? And we're not going to let anybody know about it. And they were doing exactly the same with oil. They probably still are to this day. When they do their seismographic surveys, they don't tell anybody what they're finding and where the oil is. They also release officially in their annual report uh, where they would know an oil reserves are, but they don't. That doesn't necessarily have any real link to reality 
you are just trusting the oil company. And you're a fool if you do as to where those oils re oil reserves. We may have loads of oil reserves under here. They may know, but we won't. So anyway, they discovered all this oil in the North Sea in the 1950s. And the point being there, let's exploit that. Let's exploit that oil. But how are we going to do it? Well, the British government wanted to do, obviously wanted to help uh, the oil companies to do it because they were going to get all the revenue from the oil. But the Americans didn't like it. They would, wouldn't, they, because what would happen if we started drilling oil in the North Sea? The price would go down. The world oil price, right? So if, we, if, if the Brits start drilling all this oil out of the North Sea, it's going to depress the world oil price. Oh, we can't have that. So uh, they said, well, OK, so we will help you financially because the city wouldn't help. The Americans would help the oil companies financially to build these rigs, etc. Uh, but only if we opened up a big domestic market for oil. And so that's what beaching was really all about. So by closing the railways down, uh, that meant that people, oh, dear, we have, we're going to have to buy cars. It brought the... the, um, the I mean, there's a, there's a kind of myth, and I ought to scotch this, really, that the railways weren't uh, affordable and that they weren't making any money, blah, blah. Right, well, we're subsidising them massively much more than we ever have before now. But that was a, a lie, too, because the railways, there's a guy called Ted Gibbons, uh, who's a former manager, a finance manager in, in British Rail, pre-British Rail even. I think, no, no he's, he was in British Rail in the 1950s and 60s. And he's, he's saying, well, we wanted to put some of the prices up, we weren't allowed to. Our price structure in the 50s and 60s for railways was totally regulated by the government. They wouldn't let you. And so that shortfall in the railway money was all due to government regulation. So the government said, oh, well... Anyway, so they brought in this guy Beeching to do the job. Now, does anybody know anything about his history? Who, where, who was this Dr Beeching that closed our railways down? Yes, sir. In fact, in fact, you're partly right. Most people would say he was from ICI, which was a very important, powerful company, private company, because it was producing all the explosives in World War II. So it was a strategically very national security important company. But he was a nuclear scientist. He was working on Br the British Atomic Bomb Project, uh, Fort Housted in the North Downs. And uh, the, who uncovered this is a guy called Richard Cottrell, who's a former Tory MEP who used to... Uh, used to uh, write for the British Aircraft Corporation, do their magazine. And Richard dug out loads of stuff about beaching, which he would found out through people that knew him personally, etc., about him being a metallurgist. So they brought this metallurgist from the Atomic Bomb Project and from ICI in to, to look at the accounts of the railways. Well, he, you know, he'd be like me looking at the accounts. I, he didn't know an, one balance sheet from a spreadsheet from anything else. He had no idea what he was doing. But he was a front man, effectively, for this close down. Uh, and the other thing about all this, of course, is it followed the Nazi model, right? Now, that might sound a bit shocking to some, but it was the Nazis that really introduced these autobahns. They had this idea they wanted everybody to have their own form of transport. They didn't like public transport. So autobahns, we had the uh, uh, freeways in the US, and then we had in the 60s, they started building motorways here. So this was a program decided by somebody from the oil industry, from the energy sector, and it was all to do with controlling governments. That is to do through saying, well, you need, you're going to be dependent on this oil revenue, uh, and also us, because we have to keep going back to the petrol companies to buy oil if we want to get around. There is no such kind of public provision. So back to the propaganda. Now, let's talk about the more modern stuff. This is one of the things I think... There's a real attempt out there, right, to bamboozle us and bombard us with so much information that we haven't got a, a we're not able to keep on top of it, right? Th I think that's what's going. If you get lies after lies after lies, night after night, day after day, you eventually think, oh god, I've had enough of this. This is this is a psychological tool to disengage people, right? So all I'd say is, don't necessarily watch the BBC, listen to the BBC or the news or whatever, but at least. Once every couple of weeks, go onto a good website, download a good podcast, like ours, of course, I'd say that, and, and just get up to speed with some of the stuff that's going on. The Turkish coup, for example, a few weeks ago. This is really massive, 
massive and it's not been looked at by any kind of main documentaries none of the news channels have looked at it was would anyone like to share with with us what they think about that who's been on, uh, checking out what's been happening in turkey because it's enormous anyone yeah you know, there's like they're shutting down loads of science like education institutes a lot of scientists have lost their jobs right loads of arrests absolutely right I wonder where they've got those lists of names of people to arrest from in Turkey. Now, you know, the Turkish Zaman newspaper a few months ago was closed down. The uh, police just swarmed into the building, closed it down. Uh, so Turkey, but the thing is, the reason why, is it, does someone over there have, a, have a, something to say as well about Turkey? Aren't they saying that, um, well, Erdogan saying that it's, it's all these fundamentalist Islamic groups that they wanted just to keep down, but is that like a cover to get all these things put away? Well, it, yes, it could be. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a, a really good article out there. I'm not sure who wrote it. I remember reading it about a week after the coup, saying this is this is Erdogan's Reichstag fire, right? So it's an excuse to clamp down on everything, right? But there's also a lot of other a lot of other interpretations of what's happening. All I'll say is what I've picked up and what I think is going on over there is about two weeks before the coup attempt, there was a, a fulsome apology by the Turkish government about shooting down a Russian jet last year, right? So there's a kind of, it seems, a rapprochement going on between Turkey and Russia a few weeks before the coup attempt. And look... Tur you can't underestimate how important Turkey is. It's at the eastern fringes of NATO, right next door to the Russians and the Caucasus, right? Number one. Number two, it's an Islamic country, and it's in NATO, whereas NATO seems to be at war with Islam in a lot of other countries. So it's all sorts of problems with keeping, I think, what's happened here effectively. And just looking at, through all the articles and all the analysis, particularly when the NATO airbase Interlik was surrounded by Turkish soldiers, uh, which has got apparently got 40 nuclear weapons on that base, American nukes. And if the Turks are surrounding that nuclear weapon base and they're saying, hang on, guys, you're going to have to do what you're told now, and then switching the power off to the Americans. Now, I imagine those Americans have got some emergency generators, right? But what's happening here is the Turks are thinking about switching sides. They're thinking about switching from being on the side of NATO to being on the side of Russia. And there's, there may be good reasons for that, you know? So we're not getting, do you see what I'm saying? We're not getting this analysis, really, in our mainstream press. It's all, oh, a terrible coup attempt. One of the things which was a real sure sign, because when it happened Friday evening, and they always happen Friday evenings, <laughs> have you noticed? Because all the, all the news media go home for two days. Right, pretty much all, and you just get a skeleton staff in able to deal with these things. Also, stock markets close, so if there's going to be a crash, it'll happen on a Friday evening, or a coup, it's going to happen on a Friday evening, which is where our show is on a Friday evening. We actually ran, actually, so just as an aside, we ran a spoof one one uh, Friday saying it's just been announced that uh, that they're instituting exchange controls in Britain that that uh, uh, 40 top bankers have been arrested and blah 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 and quite a lot of people believed it you know so just in a way it's a bit like what we were doing was a bit like uh, the whole uh, what was it what was it called in the in the uh, mid 1930s with Orson Welles War of the Worlds yeah but the opposite so here's a not a scary scenario here's a great scenario this is an interesting and an amazing you know wonderful thing potentially exchange controls would basically stop people taking their money out corporations etc that are in britain that are always threatening to take their money out they say no you can't because we've just instituted exchange controls you've got to keep your money in britain huh not quite no <laughs> it would have been nice you know, a few people did enjoy it yeah, anyway, we got some very positive feedback about that. But, you know, this is one of the things you can you can do uh, with finance, financial, uh, you know, once you're on top of one of the financial, what the financial system is trying to do to us. So, uh, okay, lies, big lies. Uh, this is what it's all about, I think, is that there's this group think with enormous lies that have been told again and again and again and again. Let's go back, uh, oh, gosh, uh, to the 12th century, the Crusades. Uh, anyone heard of Prester John? Prester John was a lie told by the Vatican 
uh, which was about a whole load of Christians who were the other side of the Holy Land who were fighting to try and link up with us, right? And it was just a load of rubbish. But the Vatican put it out all across Europe, this letter from Prester John, and he was supposed to be a king living in this wonderful Christian kingdom, and they just were trying to crush the Muslims from the other side. And this went out around the nobles of Europe, and they suddenly looked at this old Prester John, we need to help him. Yeah, so they joined the Crusades. And they went down. these people got on their horses to try and help Prester John. Prester John never existed. So this is not a new concept, right? <laughs> uh, maybe. Anyway, uh, yeah, so there are some interpretations saying, oh, Prester John might have been this guy or this guy. It wasn't. It was a, and also, once they realised that they'd gone over to that part of the world and Prester John wasn't there, then Prester John shifted. He lift, moved. The Vatican moved him across the world to another part of the world. I think South America. But anyhow, so this is a big lie territory. Uh, we also had the uh, big lies of Hitler, didn't we? Uh, of this Jewish conspiracy, for example, trying to control the planet. Well, uh, what about ISIS? ISIS, isn't that our big lie of today? Uh, we had, we've got this guy who's, there's, there's talk about him running as Trump's vice president. He's called General Michael Flynn. He was the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency in the United States up until about a year ago, he retired. Michael Flynn is saying the creation of ISIS was a willful decision of the White House. We told them, yeah, if you do this, then ISIS will, yeah. And then they did it anyway. So what he's saying is this is effectively part of US policy. ISIS, the creation of ISIS, is part of US policy, Pentagon policy. So, I mean, you know, that there we, we're not really getting that on the BBC. Uh, and also, then you see... Well, I think it is true. Just a minute. Let me, let me say another thing about ISIS, right? And that is that we have photographs of, of Israeli medics treating ISIS injured soldiers and film of it too. So if the Israelis are helping ISIS and the Americans were involved in creating ISIS, this is a big lie we're being told about ISIS. There is obviously some nutters over there who are, I think, they're, they're part of, uh, uh, they're, they're sort of, shall we say, trying to make a name for themselves. There has been a big effort. Now, you, you mentioned the, uh, the, I think it was the, um, the fundamentalist uh, Turks, the Gulenist movement, right, it, which is this guy who used to be in Turkey, he's now in the U US. He has got a tremendous amount of money and he's running these Gulenist schools over in the US which are teaching a version of Islam which is not dissimilar to the Wahhabism which the Saudis have been funding since the end of the Second World War. So you've got this kind of fanatical version, a little bit like the, I don't know, maybe like the Jehovah's Witnesses or something, you know, the cult versions of Christianity, where you're setting up a crazed version of your religion in order to, to have a religious war in the future. So that's, I think, what ISIS is all about. And these people, they think that they're doing something for Allah, whatever, but actually they're just kind of, they want their, their uh, they want to do something about the situation in the world and they are being steered down that road to think that they are going to fulfil the great prophecies of the Quran, you know. So this is a trick, a really simple trick, a bit like the trick played on Gordon Brown. Look, sign here and let's have a massive bailout, you know. Anyway, so what I'm painting a picture of here, I suppose, is of forces behind the scenes who are, maybe have been there for centuries, who are really steering events. And that they, what they do is, in my experience anyway, is they, they tend to uh, look for elite institutions to control the media, which has become more and more and more controlled. I mean, I could see it at the BBC in the 1990s. You could see it closing down, see good people being sacked. You could see editors intervening to stop you know good programs being made that kind of thing and the early it was up this is under John Burt who was director general at the time and other elite institutions are of course the church uh, political parties we mentioned Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party but what about UKIP right <laughs> I don't imagine there's loads of UKIP fans here but it's a perfectly legitimate idea to think well we might want to leave the European Union in fact it's the majority view in the country apparently and so why not have a party to do it? Now, in UKIP, 
you've got three main, I think Suzanne Evans uh, and this guy Wolf and also another one. Oh, I can't remember his name. But anyway, there's, there were three main front runners to, be, to take over from Nigel Farage. All three of them have been told that they're not allowed to run. So you've got this psyop and, and, and political warfare going on in the Labour Party with Corbyn. And you've also got it going on in UKIP. What have you had in the Labour Party? Uh, sorry, the Tory Party. Well, you've had Andrea Leadsom standing against um, what's Theresa May. And, and then she just drops out at the last minute. So there's no real contest. You've got 150,000 paid up members of the Tory party. I mean, I'm, uh, anyone, anyone here? No, all right. Uh, but they've not been given any uh, opportunity to vote because Andrew Leadsom was bullied by Murdoch. Uh, and over a weekend of being talked to by apparatchiks from the Tory party, she was convinced that it wasn't worth standing. And she wouldn't be, able to be up to the job. And she stood down. So she was a, stalk, a sort of stalking horse. So everyone was thinking, well, maybe there's going to be a contest here. But then at the last minute, she pulled out and Theresa May is Prime Minister. And it's now a little bit suspicious that at this particular time in history, after this Brexit vote, we've suddenly had all our three main political parties nobbled. Nobbled? So is there any real democracy? Well, the only place you're going to get real democracy when the political parties are under attack is through the media. But hang on the mainstream media is all pretty much locked down anyway. So they can talk about ISIS night after night in these terms and get away with it. And I think, in a way, that's why, uh, you know, it, I just keep, keep uh, week after week doing this uh, show in, in Bristol is because we've got to have at least a bit, of, a bit of truth out there. I've put quite a lot of time and effort over the years into trying to uh, stay on top of this stuff. Um, And it's, and it's really a kind of uh, broadcasting and journalism is, is, and writing is a bit of an act of faith, really, because you don't know who's going to read your stuff, who's going to listen to your stuff, uh, and if it's going to be published, which often it isn't. Oh, I try and get stuff published, and they go, oh, no, I'm not interested in that. But bro broadcasting is much more direct, and the thing I love about it is that you can just literally... I could be chatting to one of you people, uh, and suddenly, literally, in the next week, you could just be talking to... I wouldn't say the whole of Bristol listens to us, but we get a, we get a very good... You know, I'd say uh, opinion formers, a lot of the politicians listen, you know, a lot of people listen to the show because they know that's where the stuff is happening. This thing on Friday with Nick Hayes was a national exclusive. It's the first time that uh, Nick, uh, the father of the LIBOR guy, has ever done an, uh, a, a TV radio interview and he did it on our show, which I was rather chuffed uh, to have. Also, uh, and just pointing out other lies, and I mean, a lot of the time it's lies of omission. Uh, does anybody know who killed uh, US President John F. Kennedy? Because this was a bit, very important moment in Western history, wasn't it? I mean, the West sort of lost its soul when John F. Kennedy's head was blown off. Uh, does anyone know? Sorry? Well, yes. The CIA were managing the whole thing. But, I mean, there's a, there's the assassin, his name is James Files. James Files was a hitman for the Chicago Mafia. And uh, he was working with a guy called uh, Charles Nicoletti and Johnny Roselli. And they came down from Chicago because there was originally a plan to kill John F. Kennedy in Chicago. And, uh, uh, and he was the guy on the grassy knoll behind the picket fence. And he had a Remington Fireball, uh, which is a, a, like a kind of short rifle, very accurate, with a scope on it. And he killed Kennedy. Now... Why haven't we been told? There was, was an article in the Daily Mail about it, actually, end of last year. Is this the guy that... Yes, it is the guy, because he's confessed to it. And the reason he's confessed to it is because there's been three attempts on his life, and he doesn't really... He wants to make sure that people know before he gets killed. And also, it's a kind of life insurance for him. If his stuff is out there, at least if it's in the, in the alternative media, and he gets killed, then you know, that's, that's going to be uh, negative for the people that hired him in the first place and the people that knew about it. His confession is well worth watching on YouTube. We've been broadcasting a bit of it on Bristol, uh, on the radio in Bristol. Uh, but he's absolutely watertight. One thing I will say about it, he's, he was completely protected as a mafia man by the CIA, by Lyndon Johnson, who was the vice president, and by the FBI. So once you've got all these big institutions that might investigate you, protecting you, you can get away with the assassination. And the reason that Kennedy was assassinated may was because of the his refusal to back the military's plan for the uh, uh, invasion of Cuba. And a lot of people were getting ready to do that, and some people then went into the Bay of Pigs and died, and there was a lot of resentment against Kennedy saying, 
you know, he should have helped us more. He should have provided all sorts of other cover for this invasion and we've been successful and these people have died. Let's kill him. And so they did. Um, and so one of the things that uh, James Files talks about, for example, is when he stood behind the picket fence pointing this, this gun and blows Kennedy's head off, he describes it very graphically. He then, uh, one of the motorcycle outriders who's with the, uh, the convoy in the famous Zabruder film, you can see him. The, the motorcycle outrider has obviously heard that the shot has come from over there that's killed the president or that's injured the president. They didn't know he was dead at the time. He hops off his bike or his motorbike, starts running up with a gun, right, a pistol, towards the guy that's killed him. Now, two guys step out in front of... You see, he was given protection, right? He had two guys in front of him that stepped out with Secret Service passes and said, no, no, no. The, the shot didn't come from over here. Go back on your bike, yeah? Where Secret Service is. So he didn't have to do anything. He had a kind of defensive wall of Secret Service people between him and the president. Now, the reason I, you know, people say, don't they, don't go on about the Kennedy assassination, but it is crucial because it, it, it is the point at which the Nazi faction in the United States and, and the Dulles brothers and Prescott Bush the Bush's grandfather, these people were definitely fascists. They were cooperating with the Nazis. They knew at the end of the Second World War the Nazis had a lot of money and that they needed safe passage, so they did deals at the end of the war with them. So, OK, you know, come over here. And also, we like your technology. We like the fact that you know how to get rid of communists, that you've got all the names of various communist spies and people like that. So there was a dirty deal done between the Allies at the end of the war with the Nazis quite clearly. And a, you know, financial empire in a way created clandestine financial empire but we're not really getting a lot about that on the bbc we get a few little bits and pieces um i don't know how much time how much time have i got well, I about 10 minutes well look shall i just throw it open to questions uh, and maybe we'll start with you because you wanted to say something about isis yeah, didn't you yeah uh okay yeah hi uh i I, I think it wasn't a deliberate creation of ISIS. You, the way you worded it there, it, it, I took it that what you were trying to put across was they were a deliberate manufactured uh, enemy. Um, and I think they have been manufactured, possibly. I can see how they've been manufactured, but I don't think it was a deliberate... I think it was more of a creation of... Uh, Stupidity, really, rather than deliberate. Well, this is, this is Michael decision. Flynn's point: was it's a willful decision. We went to the White House, to the Pentagon, and said, "Don't do this, because if you do, there's going to be a, you know, this group is going to form in Syria and Iraq." There is another side to all of this, which is the 1983 Yinon Plan. Now, how many people here have heard of the Yinon Plan? You go and have a look at it online. It's absolutely fascinating. It's an Israeli general, General Yinon. He said, what we need to do is to balkanise the Middle East. What we need to do is break up these states that are around us and we need to have a kind of, you know, failed states around Israel. Then we can expand. They were looking particularly at places like the Golan Heights, which has oil, which the Israelis... It's not Israeli territory, but they're already trying to... Ex Genie Oil, uh, Dick Cheney's company, is trying to exploit oil in the Golan Heights, and they're drilling, you know, now, even though it's not their country. Uh, and so that's another aspect of what's going on in the Middle East, is it's a US-British-Israeli plan to literally to just get those Arabs out of the way so we can expand, take over the natural, natural resources. And that, of course, is a potential fuse for what we're talking about with ISIS, which is a kind of religious war. Right, so you get all the Muslims joining the, the ISIS and all this kind of thing against the Israelis, and the the whole point there really is to get poor people fighting each other, isn't it? Isn't that what they love to do? Race wars in the United States. We've had uh, even back in the 1960s with the Sharon Tate murders. If people know about that stuff, there were attempts because uh, this was Charles Manson kind of going into Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate's house and just murdering people, yeah? These big famous filmmakers and actresses, actors and actresses. Along, along the wall were daubed anti-white slogans, even though it was white people that did it. There was a definite attempt in those days to try and get a race war going. They're trying to do the same to a certain extent, I think, in the US now by having these, like, basically saying to the police, well, just kill as many black people as you want and nothing will happen to you. There's, in fact, we've got a situation in Britain, haven't we, with, with impunity by police. OK, so the police kill somebody, there's a whole load of whatever inquests, etc., and nothing happens. It's just like, you know, when you're 
a policeman, you can do almost anything. And what is most worrying about that is that we've now, just this last week, had the announcement of loads more armed police in London. They're going to stop a terrorist attack, are they? Are they going to stop some guy driving a truck into a crowd with a, with a gun if they happen to be there? I don't, I don't really don't get this. It looks much more to me like a kind of police state as a reaction, in a way, to the crimes abroad that Britain's been doing with people like Tony Blair, Alistair Campbell, and Lord Faulkner, by the way, who was the one who altered the uh, evidence to Parliament about the, uh, uh, whether the war was legal or not. And he is one of the coup plotters against Corbyn. You know, so you know, it all starts to come together with the, Corbyn is the one they're most afraid of because he could put Lord Faulkner and Tony Blair in jail if he becomes Prime Minister and if he starts speaking out about that. That's, that's that, I think, what they're most afraid of. If you've got a criminal elite, they have to be work together to make sure one of them is in charge. And I think we are at a situation now where we have got a, a, we have got a criminal elite running the country. And of course, the other, the other thing they don't want is they don't want people like me having a large audience in, a na in the national media to uh, tell people, explain to people this kind of stuff that's going on. Anyway, any more thoughts? Yeah. Hi, thanks. Talking about ISIS and, you know, before that, the invasion of Iraq, invasion of Afghanistan, the war on terror, 911. I wonder if you've had any discussions about 9-11 on your radio show or is the, the dirty term um, um, conspiracy theorists make sure that you just don't okay. go there as well? Yeah, it goes back to the JFK assassination, that term conspiracy theory, right? Because the uh, there was a lot of uh, very good research. He just died a couple of months ago. Uh, Mark Lane was one of the first, he knew Kennedy quite well and he was a lawyer that was wrote the, some of the first books about what the conspiracy was really all about in. And this term conspiracy theorist was, and conspiracy theory was invented by the CIA in the States to put out through the mainstream, CBS, NBC and all the rest of them, to try and deflect from all of the, the uh, truth that was being told about how inadequate the Warren Commission was into the Kennedy assassination, some of the interests of people who were on the Warren Commission. So they just, you know, there's actually a document out there you can find online, which is, this is the where they said, look, this is conspiracy theory. We need to use this term, get it out to the press and use it to attack and try and discredit anyone that's telling the truth about Kennedy. Uh, but 9-11, well, I, I'm uh, the, uh, with, with a couple of other people, edit something called the 9-11 Forum which is we discuss all sorts of stuff on there. I mean, everything pretty much. Uh, and nothing is, you know, anything that's of, of uh, political interest or propaganda interest. Uh, I mean, for example, the Turkish coup, there's loads of people discussing that. And I'm the editor of that. So it's 911forum.org.uk. But yes, 911 is the big lie, isn't it? Is 911 a big lie? Well, we do re regularly. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had a guy, uh, and if anyone is, wants to get the kind of real dope on 9-11, there's a terrific book uh, called 9-11, The New Evidence. Well, it's a guy called Ian Henshaw wrote, uh, and it's been revised as well. It's really good. It's got pictures in, as well as not too much text, and it's a tiny little book. I actually uh, gave uh, 10 copies of it to a contact of mine in the army, and he said he went round Whitehall <laughs> to all the top people and he put a copy on each of them's desk saying, whatever you do, don't read that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrific, it's a really good, you know, sort of the basic stuff about the lies of 9-11. I mean, the number one, I suppose, has got to be how does the most uh, powerful and effective air force in the world allow these planes to just fly around at random without intercepting them. I mean, this is a normal thing. If a, if an airliner gets hijacked, within minutes you've got a little tornado sitting next to it if it happens above our heads here. So they're letting these planes just fly around. I mean, another another uh, aspect to it, of course, is the uh, is the, the collapse of Building 7. I mean, this is starting to, you know, if anyone hasn't looked into this, this is, this is you know, but it's, it's, we're being lied to about... Bin Laden in a cave in Afghanistan causing that. Okay, any more thoughts? Can I, Tony, can I speak? Um, yeah, that's that, what's, what's interesting is that we're, we've come to the point now where we realise, uh, or a lot of people are, are waking up to the fact that, that, they're, that we're part of a grand illusion that has been happening for, for, th for uh, you know, possibly a thousand years where, where, we, where there's been, everything's been manipulated. And now we've got all the information at our fingertips. Amazingly enough, 
right now we can all get up and we can see the answers to any question we want, which, which is on the end of our, you know, most of our phones. And the, the, this 9-11 is the most important, it's, it was a world changing action that, that, that happened. And I think it was the, it, it's the fundamental bottom rung of the ladder. And, and to me, we want, you know, it, we're, we're sitting here, it's, depre it's so depressing listening to, to the manipulation. And what we want sorry. is we want, you know, we're, no, not you, sorry. <laughs> but what, you know, what we want is we want a revolution, you know, we want a revolution. We are part of a revolution. The revolution is happening here in, uh, at the Green Gathering and, and it's expanding, which is wonderful. But the, the most important thing is, is that, that if we can get to the truth of 9-11 out to the 99% and there is the pressure put on with, with, uh, you know, with people like Vaz to reopen the investigation, there's nothing they can do about it. It's a can of worms and, and it, it will undermine the establishment and completely turn the world over. So, to, so for me... That, that 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 seems to be, you know, we're we're all looking for for the for the changeover, you know, and for me that that is a, a fundamental for for changing the world. Okay, let's let's good, really good points. So I don't want to be too depressing. You're absolutely right. There's loads of positive stuff to talk about. Really, one is because we're not watching the London media. A lot of people are using social media, particularly young people. Don't believe a lot of what they're being told, and this has become a culture, particularly amongst youngsters. Oh, you don't believe that, do you? And I remember when we were, you know, teenagers, we were pretty sceptical about the older generation who'd left this messed up world for us, you know. So that's a really positive. That's a really positive sign. The other thing is, this will be precipitated in the future. This, you know, this raising, raising of consciousness and of people getting more organised. I mean, we do it with squatting and homelessness in Bristol week after week. But it's for those people that get housed, it's a brilliant experience. You know, it really is fantastic. And the, what will precipitate it will be financial cr crunch because this system cannot carry on. It'll be either war or whatever will precipitate it, maybe it'll just be, they'll say it's Brexit that's caused the whole financial crash. But that will start to really, really make people think about what's important in their lives. And I think that will, will be like a fire under people's asses, basically. Like, right, we really, it's no, we can't just kind of carry on. In a way, what's happened is our evil that we've been doing around the world in places like Yemen right this minute and in Iraq is coming back home slowly because the rulers are, okay, so they start by fighting people abroad, and then they realise the people at home don't support them anymore, don't believe them anymore. So they have to use the same sort of tactics against people at home. So I guess that's... I don't want to w wind up quite a second. Because there is one wonderful little, wonderful little book which I came across recently, which is called Heralding Article 25, A People's Strategy for World Trans Transformation. I know nothing about Mohammed Mashabi who wrote it, but this is the future. At the end of the Second World War, people sat down and they thought, right, what should real human rights be and what should they look like? And this is Article 25 of the UN Convention of Human Rights, which is all about the right to water, the right to food, the right to somewhere to live. I mean, there are all sorts of other rights that spin off from those, but Article 25 is the core of what we really should be focusing on, I think. And that will bring the Corbynistas <laughs> and the Greens and everybody together right across the planet to transform it into a place where we can you know, live with self-respect and respecting other people no. without this kind of bully faction and maybe fi I could finish really by just saying the the one of the most fantastic movements is is are uh, the veterans for peace people who have fought in war they've been there etc SAS SBS infantry etc and they're coming together and say it's all a load of rubbish as Smedley Butler said it's a racket and let's call it out as such so thanks everyone for listening Brilliant. Hope you yeah. round of applause for Tony that's great Okay, um, I, I'm pretty sure that Tony will be happy to take more questions outside if you haven't had a chance to have your question. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, okay. What radio station? Uh, yes, it's really Bristol quickly. Community FM, BCFM, and you'll find us, uh, the show, you can download podcasts, listen in the car or while you're jogging or whatever you do, at uh, thisweek.org.uk. Thisweek.org.uk. Brilliant. And you can Anything find else? us having a row every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Tony.